Hello and welcome to the Quincy Access Television Studios. I'm Mark Crosby. Thank you for joining us for State View, a program that looks at various uh, concerns, various issues, various legislation out there at uh, on Beacon Hill and let you know how it will affect you. Well, joining me today is Senator John Keenan. He represents Quincy, Braintree, Holbrook, Abington and Rockland uh, areas within those towns and of course the city of Quincy. So I want to welcome Senator Keenan to uh, State View here today. Welcome back because yes. you haven't been in studio. Uh, a lot of people haven't been in studio in quite some time. No, it's great to be back. It's great to see you and everybody else. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. How has um, this pandemic affected business on Beacon Hill? It's, we have gotten through the business. Uh, we reacted early and I think in a, in a positive manner in terms of passing some things that made government work better remotely, whether it was at the state level or the local level, um, just allowing for public participation through uh, Zoom and other platforms. So that, that seemed to, to work pretty well. We got through the budget uh, over the course of several months for this current fiscal year. Normally we pass a budget for it to take effect at the end of June and take effect July 1st. Last year, uh, we did interim budgets for a, a long period of time because we were uncertain about what was going to happen with the economy. But we wrapped up that budget actually in December, right as we were undertaking the process for the upcoming fiscal year's budget, which we're in, in that process now. In fact, we had a session uh, earlier today relative to the budget. So um, we, we've gotten through it. I, uh, legislating is a people business, and so being with people, in talking with people, meeting with colleagues in their offices in the hallways of the State House, the value of that can't be understated. It's so important. And talk about um, the challenge of creating a budget, obviously, minus the revenue that was expected to come in had the pandemic not occurred. Sure, it, it was a challenge. At first, we were, we were worried that we were going to have more significant cuts to local aid, for instance, than we did back in 2008 and 2009. We were advising communities to plan on cuts of, of 10% or more. There was just so much uncertainty. But as time went on, the, the economy proved in some ways to be rather resilient. In other ways, it was really challenging. We saw our meals tax and sales taxes drop, uh, and we saw people need unemployment because of the work ending and the, those services no longer being provided. But we fortunately, leading up to the pandemic, had a rather healthy stabilization account. And so we were able to draw about half that balance, about one and a half to $1.7 billion from the stabilization account to help us get through that budget. And we were very fortunate as time went on that we did see revenues in, in some areas actually increase a little bit, in other areas not drop off as much as we had feared. And then we also were able to get assistance from the federal government that went directly to municipalities to help them with COVID-related expenses. So the combination of all that made it so that we survived uh, this current fiscal year. Our revenues are performing well. We hope to have a surplus for this current fiscal year and start looking at replenishing our stabilization account again. For the upcoming fiscal year, where we're now in, in the budget process, we will probably still have to draw from the stabilization account, but we should have the ability to replenish that uh, to some degree pretty quickly. How do you think Governor Charlie Baker did uh, during the pandemic? How did he how do you think he performed for Massachusetts? I, I thought he performed well. It's, it's easy as a legislator to always second guess the executive. It's easy for the public to second guess us and the, and the, the governor. And it, it's just easy. And this is something that nobody had experienced before. So there were mistakes made by the governor. There was mistakes made by the legislature. There's mis mistakes that were made by businesses. But overall, I, I think the governor did a pretty good job. He worked to get the resources from the federal government through the state and out to people relatively quickly. There were some IT glitches, particularly in unemployment, that were really bad. There were some IT glitches in terms of once the vaccine became available, being able to get access to it. But he, he worked real hard at it. I never questioned his motives. He was always trying to do what, what he thought to be right. And now that we are on this side of the peak of the pandemic, and particularly with vaccines, it's been proven that his method, his plan, has worked well compared to what was implemented in other states. So overall, I'd give him a good grade. 
I, I think he worked hard with it. I think the people around them, the Secretary Mary Lou Sutter's worked really hard. And, um, but I think the key to this is recognizing that we have all made mistakes and then learning from those mistakes so that if we're confronted with something like this again, we're much better prepared. As you had said, uh, we hadn't uh, been able to get together in quite some time, so I'm going to backtrack a bit and talk about uh, committee assignments sure. and uh, what the new legislative session had in store. So I, I was uh, assigned to be chair of the Joint Committee on Housing, the Senate chair, and the House chair is Rep. Uh, Jim Asairo from, um, from the House side. He's been great to work with. We have about 136 bills that have been assigned to our committee. We're in the process of reviewing those bills now. We'll put them into piles and then begin the process of making sure that every one of them, as required, has a public hearing. And then we'll make a determination as to which one should pass, whether we want to combine them into a comprehensive bill and attempt to move that out of our committee uh, through the House and, and through the Senate. I'm also the uh, uh, vice chair of the Transportation Committee, a committee that's very relevant in terms of my district, which is transportation heavy when you consider commuter rail, subway, extensive bus network, water ferries, um, all those types of things, extensive road network. So uh, that's a committee that is, is important and particularly important to the district that I represent. Going back just to uh, the Committee on Housing, affordable housing pops up, I'm sure, in all the areas that you serve. It does. Uh, presently, there are affordable housing proposals in Rockland and Abington, Chapter 40B proposals. Uh, developers have gone in with proposals to build low and moderate income housing as a component of their overall development. There are some real questions in both of those communities about whether the towns have the ability to support the developments in terms of infrastructure, particularly water and sewer. And that's being looked at very closely at the local level. And uh, the developer is going to have to work with those municipalities and ensure that the proposal, the development, doesn't negatively impact the challenging infrastructure situation in both of those communities. Um, and in other communities as well, in Quincy and in, in Braintree and in Holbrook, we see de developments proceeding. There's a project that will move forward in Holbrook right behind Town Hall that will have an affordable housing component to it. So there's a, such a great demand. And affordable housing nowadays means housing for people that are working full time, making a decent wage. Absolutely. It's a real challenge to find uh, rental housing that they can afford and really challenging to find a home. The prices of homes in every town in my district, is, is the prices are incredible. They hit the market, there's a bidding war, and they sell very quickly. And so we've got to come up with a way to, to make sure that there's more housing and as much of it as affordable as possible. When you spoke about uh, transportation, you hinted or mentioned uh, just briefly the MBTA. Certainly, uh, there's been a lot of news surrounding the MBTA. I know there's a couple of bills in the uh, Committee on Transportation really dealing with um, noise pollution, correct? Right. Uh, there's always the, the issue of commuter rail going through the communities and uh, spewing fumes and, and noise, and then also buses going through our neighborhoods that are loud and polluting the environment. On the commuter rail, the idea, at least for noise, is to try to build sound barriers, as it is, for instance, on the Southeast Expressway and, and Route 3 as well, uh, as it deals with motor vehicles. But on commuter rail, it's to make sure that the sound barrier is in place, that horns are not used excessively, but are used to prevent incidents at crossings. And then on buses, there's good news. The MBTA is moving forward, and we've been closely involved with them, on a new uh, bus garage at the low site on, on Bergen Parkway in Quincy. And there's been a, an, uh, an accelerated commitment to operating battery electric buses out of that facility. And that means buses will be quieter as they travel through our neighborhoods and that they will not be polluting our neighborhoods. And the MBTA is, is really accelerating that process, and that's exciting. And that building in Quincy, would that serve neighboring communities as well? Yes, that's uh, all the bus routes that come out of the bus barn in Quincy that's on Hancock Street right by Veterans Stadium those routes would be transferred and served out of this new facility. And, and pretty much every bus that comes out of that facility uses Quincy Center as a hub and then goes throughout the city of Quincy into Boston and into various communities south of Quincy. 
you spoke also about uh, the ferry and that was one of the areas that the MBTA amid the pandemic and low ridership was planning to cut. They did the MBTA quickly cut the ferry out of Hingham quickly drew back on the level of service that was being provided in the red line and commuter rail because nobody was using them and uh, they have now moved into restoring service to full level of service and the goal is to do that through the courses of May into June for buses for, for commuter rail for subway and for ferries and on ferries uh, myself and representative Ayers we continue our work to promote a ferry from Squanum Point Park to Boston Representative Ayers was successful in getting an allocation in the House version of the budget for that, and I, it's great work on his part. And we know that uh, the federal government is, is working on this as well, and we've been in touch with, with our representatives, uh, particularly with the infrastructure bill that's being talked about in Washington, to make sure that transportation is included and that within transportation, ferry service is included. You also sit on the Committee on Health Care Financing. What's in that committee that might be uh, of note? Well, it's all of note. Right, yeah. Saying. There's Absolutely. probably so many things we could talk about. Only in this half hour period do we have, we don't have that luxury. So, right. healthcare finance, any notes. bills that relative to our healthcare system that have a financial impact or cost money go through the Committee on Healthcare Financing. Uh, for instance, uh, if there is uh, competing hospitals looking for the same technology, the legislation regarding that may go through healthcare financing. There's a determination of need process. Do we need this certain service? Well, can somebody, can an entity, a, a hospital take a service offline? And if there's some need to address that legislatively, um, should it have to go to the healthcare financing committee? Um, so there's, there's a whole lot of things that, that go through that committee as it relates to our healthcare insurance system and our delivery system. Equitable access to behavioral health. That's one of those types of bills will go through there. I've filed a few bills this year to make sure that there is equal access to behavioral health uh, treatment. Uh, the same that you would get if you broke your arm, you should get if you need it for behavioral health purposes. We've got several pieces of legislation. It's called parity, and we're going to continue to fight for behavioral health parity. Workforce development and uh, provider retention at uh, community health centers. Yes, at community health centers, we've seen how important they are. Very important. South Just Cove here this pandemic. in Quincy, and then Manit in particular, what they have done has been absolutely remarkable. Um, but they oftentimes can't compete pay-wise, whether it's for nurses or, or physicians with downtown Boston hospitals. And so we're looking to encourage people coming out of medical schools or nurse practitioner programs to go to a community health center and to, um, you know, through a grant or some sort of loan forgiveness program or other things that would, would be structured within the community health center to show them that it's a great place to work and encourage them to stay. Um, despite not being able to offer the pay that other places do, the people that we have working in our community health centers do incredible work. I did uh, receive a vaccine uh, that was distributed through Manit, an absolutely uh, incredible system that they had in place. They did. They. And that's what a lot of the public saw, but throughout the pandemic, they stepped up and assisted the city with testing of, of um, homeless people who live in, in Quincy um, in vaccinating first responders. Every time there was an identified need, uh, Manic Community Health Center in particular stepped up and worked with the city and met that need. Truly I remarkable. I do want to uh, just uh, backstep a bit because this next piece, it does include housing. And that's uh, the grant that, um, Governor Charlie Baker announced to benefit Father Bill's mainspring. Yes, the, the goal is to end homelessness in Massachusetts and John Yaswinski and the folks at Father Bill's have been talking about that and pushing the state to do something about that for quite some time. And this grant it will be part of the funding that Father Bill's will use to build a housing resource center and then also supportive housing. So that rather than just shelter people, we will house people. And they won't be big units, but they will be units where people can get settled. And everything shows, all the, all the data shows that once somebody's settled, they've got a better chance of getting a job, keeping that job, and then they've got a better chance of meeting their uh, appointments when it comes to health treatment and becoming less likely to go to an emergency department, which is very expensive. So supportive housing is the way to go, and Father Bills has, become, has been a leader in that. And this grant, along with contribution from the city of Quincy and other state funding will and significant fundraising by father bills will move that one step closer to reality. Also uh, 
a very busy committee is the uh, Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use, and Recovery. Yes, a lot of bills have gone there. I've chaired that committee in the past, so uh, I'm thrilled that I'm still on that committee. We filed several pieces of legislation that have been assigned there. One of the ones that we're going to focus on quickly, and we already had a hearing within the committee on this, um, but one of the bills that I filed is to establish a commission to very quickly look at the issue of methamphetamine use here in the Commonwealth. It's here. It's growing rapidly. It's going to present enormous challenges to our health care system, to our law enforcement community, and we've, we've got to get ahead of it. And so we're looking to have this legislation pass quickly, and if we can do something to budget, we'll try that, uh, with the idea that in the fall there'll be a report and we will start implementing uh, programs and services that will help us avoid a methamphetamine epidemic, which could be worse than what we experienced with the opioid epidemic, and is still experiencing. One of the bills you filed uh, is to encourage acceptance of insurance by outpatient mental health care providers. Yes, insurance continues to be a struggle making sure that people with behavioral health issues um, have their treatment covered. Oftentimes it is for inpatient if they can find that level of care. Outpatient is incredibly important and we want to make sure that there is enough providers providing the service in place and that they uh, have the services that they provide covered by insurance to encourage them to keep providing those services. It's, there's a lot of private pay in the behavioral health field and we want to make sure that there's insurance coverage for people so they can get access. And talk about um, addiction, we'll talk about addiction and the importance you see in making sure an individual gets the full, I think you refer to it as the full spectrum of coverage. Yes, addiction treatment can be very individual depending, very personalized depending on the individual, it, but it, everybody should have access to that treatment. If that means, for instance, 30 days of inpatient treatment, that presently is not required to be covered under our insurance laws. Insurance companies are not required to provide coverage for that. And for one individual, that may be the exact treatment that they need. For another individual, it may be uh, a, a medication that helps them with recovery. That is generally covered, but we want to make sure that the, uh, everything that is associated with that is covered. So the key is getting access to treatment for people and making sure that that treatment is covered by insurance. If there's a missing link in that chain, then the, it, it just doesn't work. Increased data access in opioid deaths, basically opioid overdoses. Yes. Um, several years ago, I went to the medical examiner's office in, in Boston, and there were literally on the table uh, many bodies of, of people who had passed away. And I had been trying to figure out a way that we could get as much data as possible to figure where people have been, what treatments have worked, uh, what treatments haven't worked. And we used that visit uh, to quickly introduce legislation that became known as Chapter 55. We allowed various data sets in the Commonwealth to be connected for the first time. And to, we've used that to develop policy sense. What we're looking to do now is add um, some uh, data from the Department of Revenue into that to give a more comprehensive picture of those who are struggling with addiction and to learn from them, not individually, but in the aggregate, so that privacy is respected, is to, to inform us on policy. One of the things I'm noticing is that I'm keeping these glasses on throughout the whole show. I think <laughs> the last show you and I did, um, I didn't have the glasses, and I think the last show I did in studio, I only used them part, part of the time, so I'm relying on them there you go. big time right now. All right. But, um, but there wouldn't be a show if I didn't have them. So, um, Strengthening uh, prescription drug safety and drug stewardship. We all know that uh, even though prescribing of opioid medications because of our work over the last uh, 10 years and our improvements in our prescription monitoring program, what they call MassPAT program, prescribing of opioids is down by about 40 percent. And just yesterday I, I had down a by 40. Down by 40 percent. And uh, just yesterday I had a conversation with law enforcement uh, personnel who said that they're noticing that. They're seeing fewer prescription medications being sold on the street. And they are seeing, and people who are providing treatment are seeing fewer young people who had been introduced to opioids through pain medications. They're seeing fewer of those people needing treatment. And so they, it's really having an impact. Um, but there are still pain medications that are out there in people's closets. The insurance companies pay the prescription to the pharmaceutical industry for those medications, and the pharmaceutical companies are happy to fill those prescriptions. They sit in medicine chests. We think that those pharmaceutical companies should play a role 
and paying for the safe disposal of those. Something that um, I think this pandemic has affected in all of us, and that's our mental health. Speak specifically of a bill regarding children's mental health. Yes, we talked about it a little bit earlier, you know, in terms of overall access to mental health care. It is really difficult for adolescents to get, to have access to appropriate mental health care. So we've got legislation filed in a couple of respects. One is to make sure that um, we got providers who are being paid appropriate rates so that they're willing to provide care to adolescents. We want to continue funding what they call the McPAP program, where a primary care physician, a pediatrician, when they uh, have a young patient that is showing some mental health issues, that they have resources for them as a physician to know how to better treat it. So there's a wide range of things that we're trying to do to make sure that there's access for, for young people. The stories that my office has um, been involved with of young people sitting in emergency department waiting rooms, waiting to get uh, inpatient treatment would just break your heart. Some days, sometimes uh, weeks, uh, some cases many, many weeks of just sitting there waiting for a, a placement. And so we continue our work to, to, to address that issue. It's, it's, it's terrible. You can't say, oh, they're just kids. No. They'll get over it. It's just, it's growing, they're growing pains. Absolutely not. It's, uh, if there are, if parents see signs, reach out and get help for your family as soon as possible. And we've seen it, particularly with COVID, that th th these cases are increasing in number. It's been a very difficult year for young people. Oh, well, simply, I mean, I look at myself and I look at adults and I say, yes, you know, we're suffering, mm. but so are the children and sometimes even more so. Yes, absolutely. And uh, teachers are seeing it now as students are coming back to class more, they're, they're starting to see that. Um, and teachers oftentimes would be the ones that would notice these things and, and move a child to a, in the appropriate channel to get them help. But without those teachers there and parents both working, that, that avenue has been closed. And uh, teachers are seeing it now in greater numbers, and, and they need resources. I recently, actually on a monthly basis, have a uh, register of deeds, uh, Bill yes. O'Donnell joining me in studio. And one of the things he talks about is mortgage transparency. Talk about a bill regarding that. Yes, so uh, Register O'Donnell has asked us the last couple of sessions to file legislation. What had happened, and it particularly happened back in uh, you know, 2005, 6, 7, 8, leading up to the last crisis we had, was that you'd, you'd buy a home, you'd go through your local bank, and you'd have a mortgage, or you'd go through a local mortgage broker, and there'd be a mortgage. And you would make your payments, and every once in a while you get a notice, send your payment to somebody else. And you would do that. And so you knew kind of who had your mortgage, but in the meantime, that assignment from bank to a mortgage company to somebody else was not being kept in the public records, wasn't being filed, that assignment wasn't being filed in the Registry of Deeds. And so all of a sudden, you know, seven years later, you go to sell your house, you've been making your mortgage payment to company Y, and you think you're all set, but nobody, you know, nobody realized that there have been four mortgage companies in between, that there had been an assignment and there's no paper trail, and so the buyer's bank says, you have to figure that out. And it can delay the process for weeks and months. So this would require every assignment to be recorded in the registry deed so that everybody knows who holds their mortgage. And when it comes time to sell, there are no questions or gaps in that chain uh, relative to financing. Also, I just, I, I guess, hot off the, uh, the press, I noticed uh, in the Quincy Sun an article regarding mail-in voting and your opinion on that. Yes, so we, part of the, one of the things we did as a legislature early was to allow for early voting and mailing voting in the elections last fall. We extended that through the spring for municipal town elections, and there's work being done on a, a bill to extend some or most of those provisions to the upcoming fall elections and beyond to make them permanent. One would be early voting in both uh, primary slash preliminary elections as well as final elections, and then also um, to do uh, mail-in voting in, in those elections. Our clerk here in Quincy, Nicole Crispo, who comes on your show, her and her staff did an incredible job. I think they were the best uh, in the state, and all those in the towns that I represent really stepped up and did incredible work as well. They showed that it can work, and they showed that you, know, you don't have to worry about fraud and everything else, that they have the controls in place, and they can make voting easier for people. 
and as a democracy, that's what we really should be doing, is making voting easier for people, but ensuring that we have proper safeguards in place. And here in Massachusetts, the, it works, and it works well, and I think it works throughout the country, although it's, you know, it's become a very political issue, but overall, I think it's safe and we can guarantee the integrity of our elections with uh, proper resources and, and leadership like we've seen here in Quincy and in the towns I represent and all across the Commonwealth. And Secretary Galvin was, I think, the right person at the right time to, to drive it statewide. I know you were at uh, a rally in the city of Quincy regarding violence against Asian Americans. Uh, talk about that and uh, how that has become an issue nationwide. When you see the videos of some of the incidents nationwide, it, it's just heartbreaking. And we haven't had, given our large Asian population, incidents quite like that here, thankfully. And I think part of that is because the Asian population has uh, been here a while, and they're our friends, and they're our neighbors, and they're our friends and neighbors, and we, we all uh, know each other. That doesn't say it, it can't happen here. Um, but what came out at this rally was that it doesn't have to be an act of violence that makes the news that is, is, is um, that shows you know, an animosity to a certain race, like, like the Chinese population, particularly in Quincy. It can just be a look, it can be a statement, it can be words, and we do have those things happening here in the city of Quincy as they do all across the country. And we have to do everything we can to send the message, we're just not gonna tolerate that. If we hear a joke that makes fun of a certain uh, group, we should just say, you know, hey, that's not funny. Uh, if we see somebody giving somebody a hard time just because of the way they look, it should be, you know, don't do that. And we've got to realize that we have a, an obligation, and particularly on social media where so much of this spreads, that we have an obligation to do what we can to stop it. Um, in Quincy, we've got a great community. Uh, there are friends, our neighbors, there are our children's classmates and friends, and we, we all have to stick together. And throughout your district, the number of Asian Americans still significant? Quite significant. Uh, I haven't seen the census figures yet for Quincy, but my guess is that it will be a bigger number than we've had in the past. In some parts of the city, in North Quincy, for instance, there are neighborhoods where the vast majority of people are Asian, and particularly Chinese. Uh, there has been a, a growth uh, in, in, in Braintree, and across the, the district, we've seen the towns become more, more diverse. Some to a greater extent than others, but definitely there's been a, a growth in diversity, which I happen to believe is a wonderful thing. I traveled one time, I was away for about 10 days, and I came back and I was at the International Terminal at JFK waiting to get a flight to come to Boston. And I must have heard eight or 10 languages, seen people dressed eight, 10 different ways, and I said, it's good to be home. It, it's such a rich cultural experience, and it's so unique to our it's country. It's an education. It is, and we, we have to embrace it. It's been the story of our success as a nation, and we have to continue to embrace that. Well, Senator, we've come to the end of this program. Uh, still a lot to talk about. I hope uh, to have you back in uh, in short order. We'll discuss more. That would be great. Welcome the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. Same here. And thank you for watching. Please continue to watch Local Access TV for more important information.